Welcome to CSC 31 lecture 20. So today we're going to continue with the CPU design. All right, so before we go into the content of the lecture, um, the project two is due on Monday the 4th. Okay, so, so you have until midnight and then starting from the next day, um, we can start do the demo. So for those who are in the lab on Tuesday and after, make sure you demo your project two to your TA. So I will send the source code to your TA with the similarity test results. So your TA will ask you questions about those submissions. Okay. And for those who are in Monday's labs, um, you may want to go to your TAs after um, the other uh, lab session uh, for your from your TA, or you can arrange with your TA to do the um, demo um, the following week or doing the, um, doing the office hours. So it depends on your TA's uh, decision. Okay? And just keep in mind that your submission will be final, which means that I'm not going to allow you to uh, make any corrections. So whatever is demoed, that, that's, um, that's the final score you'll get. So pay attention to any mistakes as well as um, um, double check your submission before you uh, click the submit button. Make sure that you're uploading the correct file because after the submission day, I'm not going to um, take any new submission and then do the similarity test anymore because I don't really have enough time to, to do that. And actually it will slow down the demo process. Okay. So everything is final after Monday, May 4th. So just be careful, okay? And lab nine is your last lab, so there won't be any lab anymore. So next week when you come to your lab, basically you just do the demo of your project too. And maybe um, if you get permission to do demo, well, you can, actually you can do lab nine too, because last week you have lab nine due, and then this week you can still demo your lab nine. Okay. And homework seven is due also on Monday, and we are gonna have the last homework, homework A, which is due the last day of the semester. But I would suggest you to try to do it before the exam on the ninth, because um, homework eight is about the CPU. So it's better to um, work on those problems before you take the exam on Saturday on the ninth. Okay. And here is the summary of the leftover exam. This coming Wednesday, our exam will be on floating point numbers. So make sure you understand how to convert floating point numbers from zeros and ones, the binary to base 10, as well as from base 10 to binary. Okay. And come to my office hour on Monday, I'll do some demo um, to illustrate how to do it as a review. And also, uh, I will also ask questions um, from your midterm one about the integer representation. So all the ones complements, twos complements, but um, bias, so I'll ask them again. So, all, so both, integer and floating point convergence. Okay, so, we, so keep in mind. And on Saturday, I will focus on um, CPU. So basically from your last lecture all the way to the last, the, the, the two lectures from the last week of lectures. Okay. And then the second hour of the exam will be mainly, or the second part of the Saturday final exam will be mainly C programming or as all sorts of of C programming questions um, that you have learned from your project one, from your lab one to four, as well as from your homework one. Okay. So please study for that. All right, so last lecture, we end with the five stages of our CPU. So we talk about um, that in the CPU is divided into two portions. Okay. The first portion is the choo-choo train. Okay. What it means is that giving you the instruction of zeros and ones. How can a CPU understand the, the meaning of it, right? And then not only understand, but actually perform the operations and store the result, right? So provide the result. So actually it takes um, five stages inside the data path. So this is called data path, the choo-choo train right? So it is the, the path of information okay, that being transformed throughout the path. And at the very end of the stage, it will provide the um, value that we need. 
for the computer. Okay, so this is called data path. So it takes five stages, which means that it takes five steps to process the instructions from the memory to produce a result. So the first stage, of course, is to fetch the instruction. So we have the instruction memory or actually is in the instruction cache. And again, this semester, we didn't really have time to go over that. But when you take CSC 140, you will definitely learn what cache is. And, and also, I have given you the reading assignment for chapter six already. So, so hopefully, by reading that, you have some idea of what cache is. And cache is just a temporary storage in your CPU that stores a subset of information from your memory so that CPU doesn't have to communicate with the memory that often because it takes time to go, go outside of the memory. Okay. All right, so the first stage is to fetch your instruction. Okay. So at this stage, you get your PC, which is the address of your instruction. So remember from the end of assembly language, we learned that our assembly language, our program later on becomes zeros and ones, right? And, and they are stored in the memory. So which means that each line of code has its own program counter or we call the address, right? So given you the address, you go to the instruction memory or cache to get the instruction. So this is the first stage, instruction fetch. And at the same time, you add four to your current address so that you're ready for the next instruction. So why we add four? Because each instruction is four bytes, right? So after this instruction, you add four, it becomes the next four bytes. Then you have the right instruction for the next line. Okay? So this is the first stage. Now, once you get the instruction, the next step is to decode the instruction. This is just like in your last exam, right? You have the zeros and ones. What does that mean, right? You find the opcode so that you know what format it is. And then based on the format, you partition the rest of the instruction into the right field. And we get RS, RT, RD, shift among function code or immediate or the jump target address, right? So it all depends on the decoding. So not only to decode what it does, but also it goes to the right register to grab. It. For example, I need RS as um, S0 and an RT as S1. So now second stage would go to the register S0 and S1 and grab the content and prepare those content for the operation, which is the next stage, execution. So by the end of your decoding stage, you should have the operands ready. So either two register values or one register values plus one immediate. So these are prepared during the decoding stage. And execution state basically is just to take in these operands and perform the execution. And that's all, right? So based on what kind of operation it is, right? And also, you know that from the decoding stage. And now, the next stage depends on the instruction now. If your instruction is low word storage, so this kind of memory access instruction, then you will take in the value from the ALU, which is the final address, right? So because when you do low word storage, you need to add the address with the offset. So this is done in the ex execution stage. And now you have your final address, you access the memory, either write to it or read from it. Okay? But for those who don't need memory, for example, F, F, I, shift, then the result of ALU will just bypass it. Okay? So it doesn't involve memory at all. And finally, it depends on the instruction. If I have low word, I have um, N, I, and or sub, uh, this kind of out, arith arithmetic instructions, I have to store the result, right? I need to store the result back to either RD or RT, depends on the uh, instruction format, right? Then I will use the last stage, um, register write, to write back to the register. Okay, so this is the common five um, stages of a data path. Okay, so you take in the instruction, decode it, get the, the data ready, and perform the execution. And then use the result either to access the memory or you just bypass the memory and write it back to the register. Okay? So which means that after the execution, the result is not automatically written back into the register yet. Okay? So you just carry on these data until the last stage, 
and the right path. So it's kind of like an assembly line. So this is data path. All right, so once we have the data path, okay, then of course, just like a train track, right? So we need someone to control where um, the data goes to, right? For example, here, when do I use two register instead of one register value and one immediate value, right? So this is the job of a controller. So when we receive the instruction, when we do the decoding, right? We know the opcode, we know the optional function code, right? If it's in our format, then we know what kind of operation it is. By knowing what kind of operation it is, the controller will, will control the flow of the whole choo choo train train. Okay, so it will let um, the data path know, okay, you turn on this route, you shut down this route, so that only the correct route is connected. And then at the end of the five stages, you get your result back in the register, and then you finish this instruction, and then go to the next instruction. So this is the job of the controller. And I'll leave uh, the controller until the last lecture to go over it because um, it takes some uh, knowledge that I'm gonna talk about today to, to understand the control basis. All right, so the next thing is about clock. So a lot of times when we buy CPU, um, I'm not sure whether you are aware of your CPU, but if you uh, build your own system before, okay? So for example, you buy a CPU, buy a motherboard. So the performance usually um, of a CPU is described by clock, right? How many gigahertz, right? For example, um, the fastest um, consumer CPU right now is the new Intel, right? They, um, the base clock is like three point some gigahertz, but you can overclock it to almost five gigahertz, right? So, so that's crazy, it's like so fast that you can overheat your CPU. Okay, so in order to, to overclock, you really need a good heat sink. Otherwise, you can fry an egg with your CPU. All right, so what does that mean by clock? As you mentioned, right? Clock um, CPU is a synchronous digital system. Synchronous means what? It's based on the clock. So the idea is um, when we have the five stages for a type of CPU called single cycle CPU is that we finish everything in one cycle. So this is called single cycle CPU. So when the clock goes up, goes down, and it goes up again. So this is one period, right? If you think about um, physics, right? We learn sine wave, electricity. Okay, so this is a sine wave, but in this case, it's a digital wave. So either high or low, that's all. So it is not a sinusoid uh, curve. So, but same idea, the period is from the current up to the next up. Okay, so this is one period. And for single cycle CPU, it means that within one cycle, you can finish all five stages, right? So I can finish my instruction fetch, decoding, execution, memory, and register write. So in this kind, in this kind of CPU, the time it takes to finish each stage is different. Okay. So it can be faster, it can be smaller for certain uh, stages. Okay. So, so this is uh, what we call single cycle CPU. As long as you finish all five stages into one cycle, then that's, that's all the CPU cares. Okay, it doesn't really care about which in this one cycle that you finish what stage. Okay? So as long as you finish all stages, then you're fine. So you, the clock kicks in and you start doing all these five instructions, right? Uh, five stages. And by this time, the clock kicks click up again. You're done with this instruction and you're starting the next instruction. So this is called single cycle CPU. And in fact, actually, we don't do this kind of single cycle CPU anymore because it's just not efficient. Okay, so later on, we'll talk about why okay, in, in future classes. So modern CPU, we use what we call multiple cycle CPU. What it means is that every single up and down, okay, with, between one period, you do one stage. So I will do instruction fetch. I will use second clock to do decoding and then execution and then memory and then register write. 
So in this case, every single click tick of the clock is one stage. So now basically by clicking the, the clock, then the CPU will know what stage you're in. So basically it's very systematic now. And because of that, we expect each stage to last the same amount of time, and which is actually may not be a good idea too. But on the other hand, um, this is how we can improve the performance. And again, we are not gonna talk too much about the improvement of performance in CSC31. So in CSC31, uh, we are only expected to learn the basic uh, reasoning of a CPU, the how CPU understand the zeros and ones, that's all. And then once we go to CSC140, we go into um, the more advanced topic on how to improve our current CPU to make it faster, to, to be better. So basically, right? So from this kind of what we call pipeline or overlap, all the way to multiple CPU core, like yeah, the modern CPU. So it's, it's a very in interesting class. May not be that straightforward as you can imagine because CSC 30 is not easy, right? CSC 31 is not easy. So, so 30, 140 will be more advanced on top of CSE 31, but actually it's a very important class. So even though it's an elective, I do suggest you to take this class before you graduate, because if you think about it, everything is internet of things right now, right? So a lot of devices like Alexa devices, right? So they are all built, um, controlled by the CPU inside. And a lot of times um, these are all embedded system, which means that there's no operating system. There's no, uh, programming tool. Basically, we just write program directly into the chip. And that's why it's better to be able to understand how CPU work so that you have an edge in looking for a job. Okay, so take that class and then take operating system after 140. And then you have a very good idea in terms of how a computer works. And then you can write a very good software based on that. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at what kind of hardware do we need, all right? So we know that we have five stages and it takes all these five stages to run different sorts of instruction, right? So now let's take a look at what kind of hardware do we need? Well, we need something to store our PC. What is PC again? The address of my current instruction, right? So, which means that I need a storage, right? I need a register. So basically register means a storage in, in the CPU. Okay, so yes, we have the 32 registers in MIPS, but on top of that, we actually have a lot more registers in our CPU, right? So we need one to store our PC, and we need um, several registers, we call that general purpose registers, to process our information. Right? So these are the MIPS registers that we talk about. And of course, with different brands of CPU, you have different registers, number of registers. And we need um, the memory. In this case, actually, um, is the cache. Right? So CPU has a separate set of memory. Okay, so this memory, we call that cache. So when you buy a CPU, you will see level one cache, level one, two cache, and sometimes level three cache. And so what are they talking about? So basically, uh, different layers of memory within the CPU. So what it does is you in order to do, like for example, to process your array, let's say, right? so you, or to process your instruction, you need to go to the memory, right? To fetch this instruction and fetch this data from the heap, from the static, from the, from the stack, right? But memory is far away from CPU. It takes a long time to go out of the CPU and grab them and use them. So every time you need to do that, then you're wasting your time. Right, you lose the purpose of a fast sleep CPU. Right? So as a result, CPU designer will build this internal memory within the CPU and we call that cache. And kind of like a temporary storage, kind of like um, what we call buffer, right? So, so instead of always go to the memory, you just keep a certain amount, like a subset of it, and keep that into your vicinity so that whenever you need it, let's look at the cache and see whether you have it. If you have it, you can use it right away, right? Use it right away. So 
it's a lot faster, right? So you don't have to go to the 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 memory. So I always use a library as an example. Right? So if you live in a dorm in on campus, right? So so especially the the dorm that is far away, the glacier, right? So now every time in the hot summer, you you want to check out a book, you want to look look for a book, you go to the library and check out a book and bring home, right? So so it's far and it's hot, right? So you don't really want to do this. So what do we do? We go to the library, check out a lot of books, right? So that you may you may need them, and then you place those books in your room. So now whenever you need to do some research, you just look through those books in your room and see whether you have it, right? So if you have it, then good. You can use it right away. You don't have to go outside of the dorm and go to the library again. Okay, so this is the idea of cache. Yeah, so keep your information close to you so that you can use them right away. Okay, so we use that in our stage one and stage four. Stage one, memory for the instruction. So instruction memory, instruction cache, and stage four is a data memory and data cache. Okay. And we need an ALU, which means that we need the um, arithmetic logical unit. Okay, so what it does is to perform the operations, right? So to do the basic ar math arithmetic, we do the logical and and or as well as shifting. Okay. So we we'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay, so because this is a pretty much the functional brain of your computer. And of course, besides those uh, registers that we use in our program, we also have some miscellaneous registers to keep track of the value. Okay, for example, remember, right? The output of your ALU does not go directly into the register yet, right? It will wait until the fifth stage in order to go, right? So which means that we need somewhere to temporarily store this information. Okay, so we have some temporary register. So inside the CPU, there are a lot of storage actually, just to, so that we can store temporary values. So we call that buffer sometimes, right? Okay, so here again, is just the recap of five stages. And now let's look into how we actually make this choo-choo train right work, okay? Because from here, we can see that ALU only operates on two operands, right? If you think about that, eight, one, two, three, four, right? For R format, I format, it doesn't matter. It always takes in at most two registers or two values, I should say, not register. And then perform the operations and then output a value, right? So now we have two occasions, right? One is that R format, I provide two registers content. But with I format, I have one register content and immediate content, right? So now how does this CPU make the change, right? To, to allow two registers value go in or to allow one register value and then one immediate. So how does it work? So we need to look into this green square and just find out how actually we can perform this split of track, right? Just like the railroad system, okay? So before we go into that, let's take a look at I can't see you guys, okay? So let's see, okay? Let me ask you a question. How many of you have a PlayStation at home? Don't lie to me. I'm sure you're playing your PlayStation now while you're watching your video, probably, right? Okay, all right, so second question. How many of you have an Xbox at home? Okay, some of you, right? Don't lie to me. Okay, next question. How many of you have both PlayStation and Xbox at home? Don't lie to me, I'm sure there will be someone, okay? And probably you're playing both now. All right, so now why I ask this question is that usually, okay, I don't know about you, usually you will have one TV hooked up to those two consoles, right? Or with a DVD player, so you have three inputs, right? But how many consoles or channel are you watching at a time? Usually just one, right? So when you're playing your PlayStation, I don't think you have, you will turn your TV input to both um, PlayStation and Xbox. It just doesn't make sense, right? You don't use one eye to play, to look at 
your PlayStation and then one eye to watch your Xbox video, right? So it doesn't make sense. So which means that giving you a TV, yes, you can hook this up with um, many inputs, right? PlayStation, you have um, Xbox, you have a Blu-ray, and then probably you have a Swift too, right? A Switch, not Swift, okay? But at any given moment, I hope you only just use one input, right? So how does your TV actually do the switch, right? So we use what we call switch, right? But actually in electronic, we don't call that switch. We call that a MUX, multiplexer, right? What does that do? So for example, here I have a two to one multiplexer. What does that mean? This is kind of like your TV, all right? And this is your re remote control, okay? So you send your remote control signal to your TV to choose the input. So since I have only two inputs, so I'm poor, I only have a PlayStation and a DVD player, right? So I can either play PlayStation or I watch a DVD, okay? But I need to decide on the input, right? Since I have two inputs, two, two choices, how many bits do I need? So how many bits can cover two values? One bit, right? When the input is zero, I will have channel zero. If I have input equals to one, I have channel one. That's all. So two options. So S is just to control one bit. And when I choose zero, whatever is in A will pass through my TV and go to your eye. Okay, so when you see a line with stroke and then with a number, it means that how much data is passing through or connected at a given moment. So if it's a 32 bit, then n will be 32, which means that I have 32 bits value simultaneously going through the TV. Okay, so basically this is what we call a MUX, or in basic um, outside world we call it a switch, right? Because we switch between the channels, but actually we call that a MUX in electronic, okay? in electrical engineering. Okay, here I have a four to one MUX, so which means that I'm allowing four different inputs. Right, to go through the TV and I can watch one at a time. Okay. So again, this is not called a switch, okay? In electronics, we call that MUX, okay? So in this case, because I have four inputs, how many bits do I need now? How many bits can cover four values? Two bits, so that's why I have a stroke with a two, means that it takes in two bits to go inside, okay? So two bits, which two bits? S1, S2. So one means on the uh, left, and I mean S1 and S0. So S1 means uh, the most significant bits, and S0 is the least significant bits. So since I have two bits, there are four options. 0, 0, channel 0. 0, 1, channel 1. 1, 0, channel 2. 1, 1, channel 3. So by picking the correct combination of two bits, I will allow one of the channel to go through. Sounds good? So four, three console, right? PS4, Xbox, Switch, and then you have a high 4K Blu-ray, right? So this is called a multiplexer. So now same thing. With the CPU, we can use the same idea, right? So I have multiple inputs, but at any given moment, depend on the operator, okay? Depend on the function code or the opcode, I only allow one input to go to go through. Okay, so here is an example. I have my register file that store all my 32 registers. Right, so I have my RSLT for read. Okay, so now what do I do? I can allow. So here you can see I have A and B, right? So that corresponds to the bus A and bus B. Why we call that bus? Because we carry multiple information into the destination that's why it's called a bus a bus of students right a bus of passengers okay so how many of them 32 of them because every time i process 32 bit of information right a word right either it's an rs rt right whatever you store in the register it is a register it is a register of 32 bits so i will use a what we call bus to transfer the data so the connection between components, we usually call that a bus because it carries more than just one 
bit. So this is called bus. So bus A corresponds to R A, register A. Bus B corresponds to register B. So, so if a instruction, if an instruction uses two registers as an operand, what kind of instruction is it? What kind what format is it that would read two registers? R format, right? So for R format, I'll have bus A, which is RS. Okay, so your first source will go to bus A. So during the decoding stage, the CPU will go to RS, whatever RS is, grab the data and pass this data through bus A and go to the, the input of your ALU. And same thing with RT, right? If it's an R format, I'll have RT as my RB, which means that I will put them into my bus B. Okay. But now you can see that I have a mux here. And this mux is called ALU source, which means that this ALU can only perform operation on two input. That makes sense, right? Because we don't need three inputs. We're not doing A plus B plus C. We only can do A plus B, right? So now the second input depends on the format of the instruction. It's in an R format, which means that the data is from RT, okay? If it's an R format, right? If it's an R format, which means that I need to turn on my channel zero. So ALU source will switch to zero. So now this TV will be turned on to this channel. So bus B will go through that and becomes the input of your ALU. Sounds good? But what if this is an I format? I format, what do we have? We have RS, right? As your bus A. So you still go through this. So that's why there's no but uh, there's no must max here. Because either I format or R format, you still need RS as your first register uh, first um operand, right? But now since this is I format, I need my immediate. So this is immediate. So this is the last 16 bits. So that's why it's called immediate 16. You only have 16 bits. But ALU takes in 32 bits. Okay, so what do you do with the missing third, uh, 16 bits? I extend it. Okay, so if your number is less than um, 2 to the power of 16, that's fine. Right? So then you don't have to worry about that. You just extend that by using zeros and ones right, to, to pet that. If, if it's a sign extension, then based on the sign, we talked about that already, right? If, if it's negative, then we will just pet ones in the front so that it becomes negative. But if it's a positive, then you just put zero in front of that, so the sign doesn't change. Now, after going through this extender, you have 32 bits. So, so again, CPU can only process 32 bits. So your immediate I format only gives you 16 bits. Remember that, right? Because you cannot have more bits to store. So you have to extend that to 32 bits based on the operation. So read your MIPS sheets. It talks about what kind of extension, zero extension or sign extension. And then it becomes 32 bits. And once you have this 32 bits, since this is I format, you want this information to go through this mark to the input, right, of the ALU. So now your ALU source should turn on this channel one. So we think that it becomes one. Okay, so ALU source is zero, it's our format. You allow bus B to go through. ALU source is one. Is I format, you allow this immediate to go through. So any given moment, you can only allow one to turn off, okay? You cannot allow both because this is a mark, only one at a time, okay? And what about this RTRD? So this is about W. What is W? Write. So this is about your fifth stage to write back. When you have R format, you read RS and RT, right? That corresponds to bus A and bus B. But where do you write back to? You write back to RD, right? So in this case, you are writing into register and your destination, the control of your mux, here is another mux, is to write to your RD. So you need to choose one. So again, when you have R format, you have bus A and bus B. So you need to turn on this ARU source to channel zero. And when you write back, you need to 
right into your RD. So your registered destination channel will be channel one. Okay. But if you have an I format, you have bus A, you have immediate extend version so that you turn on channel one for your ALU source so that this 16 bit becomes 32 bit and can pass through this so max becomes an operand. Okay. And after it is done, the value will go back to your register file and go to your right register. And now this is I format. We store in RD or RT. Well, I format does not have RD, right? So you write into RT, the packet format, which means that your register destination is zero in this case. So basically, this is how the control works, right? The control basically determines these um, max value. Okay, whether to turn on channel zero or turn on, turn on channel one. Okay, so, so it is based on the control. Okay, so this one again is to choose what to which register to store the result. And this one is to choose uh, which input to, to go to the uh, ALU, whether it's R format, allow the register RT to go to, or I format, allow the extended version of the immediate to go to. And then again, this is an extender to make your 16-bit immediate to 32-bit immediate so that your ALU can handle the 32 bits, right? Because ALU can only process 32 bits at a time. Okay, so here is an example of either R format and I format, okay? For the basic opera. So I, in this case, it's one format. What do you think? I have four fields, so I format, right? Since this is I format, what do I have? I have RS as my operand, immediate as my operand. So I will use bus A as my RS value, immediate, since this is 16 bits, right? So I will extend that. In this case, the, the MIP sheet. So this line is coming from MIP sheet. So it depends on the operation. It depends on your opcode. And it says that it's zero extension, which means that I will pad the front of your 16 bits in, with zero. So you have all zeros, 16 zeros, and then your copy of the 16 bits of the immediate. And now, since this is I format, which channel do I turn on? Which data do you want to pass through this month? I format. This immediate, right? So I need to turn on channel one. So now I have RS, I have immediate. So the ALU perform whatever this operation is. Produce the result. The result goes back to your register file. Go to the right port. And then which register to write to? Our key, right? So I will turn on register destination channel zero. And then write it back to RT. And I'm done. Okay. So I color code that so that you can read carefully. You can match them. RS is to read, so I have RA, which is going to A plus A. Immediate is also to read, so I have immediate, extended it, and passed through the mask. And then when you have the result, you write it back to your register, and you write back to RT. Okay. And what about this RT? Okay, so again, these are the read port, because that's why I read RS, right? So do you actually read this RT? No, you don't care, right? So yes, RT probably value would be here, but you don't really care because just like you're playing your um, DVD player. So you let your DVD player playing a movie, but you switch your TV input to PlayStation so that you can play the PlayStation. Do you really care about what your DVD is playing? No, because you don't watch it, right? So. Since you set your channel for I format into this channel, you don't really care about what's being passed to plus B. It is a wrong data, that's fine. Because your MUX has blocked it. Your MUX is allowing channel one to go through anyway. So you really don't care about what's in this plus B. Yes, the CPU is still gonna read this, that's fine. But your choo-choo train channel, stop that. Okay, so the trail 
the railroad track actually combines this to here. Okay, so connect this to here. So you don't really need to care about what's in that speed. It's just a bunch of noise that is not going to be processed. So don't worry. The mechanism is there. The CPU is still going to read this, but it's not going to enable it because it's turned off, right? So that's how the control works, okay? So because there are sorts, all sorts of um, electricity going, or the electron signal going back and forth, but we use the mux to stop the jump so that the correct information can go through. So that's how um, we, we deal with it. So think about your electric plug on the wall, right? So if, if you don't plug, uh, plug in anything, doesn't mean that there's no electri uh, electricity, right? If you plug in your finger into a hole, you feel that, right? So same thing. The data in RT is there, but because of I format, you are not just you, you just don't use it. That's all. Okay? So the signal is still there, but you don't use it. All right. So we don't care. Okay. So because first B is blocked. Okay. So how about low memory or dealing with memory? This data path doesn't work, right? I have register file to provide me the source registers, the, the operator. And then I have the operator to perform the operations, right? No word is what? If you go to your MIP sheet, I will go to the RS, grab my address, the, the, date, the address is stored in RS, and then I do sign extension of your immediate to make it um, the 32 bit, right? So I have RS, go through bus A, immediate, the magenta color, go through this mux, channel one, go to the ALU, right? So again, I choose ALU source as one so that immediate, the 32 bit, the sign extended version of my immediate will go through here, okay? So now I perform the operation. And what is the result? Do we store this result into register RT? Do we store the sum into RT? No, right? We go to the memory and grab that content. And so I'm going to the memory at this final address, grab the content and save it into RT. So what is missing in the diagram? I need a memory unit, okay? Oops. So this is a memory unit. So, and then I introduce another mask. So I'll talk more about the mux later, okay? So here, the output of, if this is a low word, okay? This is a memory access. The output of the sum, the ALU gives you just the address, right? So yes, you have bus A, which is out as the base address, immediate, extended, so that you have the offset. Now you add them up. That gives you the address right so the address goes to the address port of your memory right and then the ALU control will tell the ALU what kind of operation it is so in this case just an add right so now it performs the add give you the 32-bit address go to here now you load the data because this is a lower right lower so you go to this address grab the data and ready to be output, right? So now I have another mux. What does this mux do? What are the two inputs here? The channel zero, output of ALU. Channel one, output of your data memory. So for low work, which channel do you want to turn on? And this is the reason of the mux. Okay? The mux only allows either the output of the ALU to go through or the output of the memory to go through. So for low work, which, one, which channel do you want to turn on? Channel one, right? Because you want to load the memory data into the register RT. So I would turn on channel one. So which means that for low work, I turn on channel one. For other arithmetic um, operations or shape or logical operation, I will allow channel zero, okay? Because I don't care about the memory at that time. For that one, because the result of your ALU will be stored to the register. Okay, so, but for low word or the low memory, it is the data from the memory that I want to pass you. So in this case, memory to register, 
memory to register is turned on one, which is true. So now, data memory data goes through the register uh, to uh, the, the MUX, go through that, and then go to the register file and write it back into RT. So the destination is zero again, the channel zero to go to RT. So this MUX will block the result of the sum because you don't need that, you are not saving that. The result of the sum is just the, ad the address, right? So that's why you, you keep it away. And then you grab the data from the memory and turn on channel one, and now it goes back to the register. How about store word? Same thing. Store word is an I format. I will go to RS, grab the data, pass through the bus A. This is the first operand. What is the second operand? Immediate, right? So that's the offset, right? The immediate. So now you extend it, it's still sign extension, and it becomes 32 bit. And now you want it to go through this mux, right? So ALU source is one, so that this channel is turned on. And now the operation is add. So you add these two together, becomes the final value. And what is that? This is the address. Right? So this is the address you want to access to your memory. But this is what? Lower the storage. This is a store. What does that mean? Then I'm going to store what's in RT into the whole memory address, right? What's in RT to the memory. So memory at this address equals to what's in RT. So you have the address, go through the address, and what is the input to the memory, right? Because we need the RT. Where's RT? Remember RT is here. So now what we need is to create another connection to connect from bus B directly to the data in of our memory. And then we have the memory write enable. So in this case, I'm gonna to write to the memory. So I'll turn on the switch, the write switch. Okay, so, so there's different signal again from the CPU. So since I'm writing into memory, I will turn it on. Okay, or just like, if I need to write into a register, I need to turn it on too. Okay, so now, after adding the address, I access the address, access the address, as well as copy what's in bus B to the data in port of my memory. Now I write the data into the memory. And which channel do I turn on for memory to register? Do we really care what channel to turn on? Probably not, right? Because we are not writing anything back to the register, do we? We end here. The fourth step is done which means that I don't really care because I'm going to turn off the register right so that nothing will be written into the register. Okay? So I don't care about turning on zero or one here okay? because my TV is off. Okay? So it doesn't matter your channel is one or zero, I will just shut off my TV so it doesn't go to the screen. Does it make sense? Okay, so this is store memory. All right, so now how about branch? Branch is a little bit different, right? Even though this is I format, we have what? We have two comparison, right? We compare what's in RS and what is RT, and then determine whether to go to a place, right? As, and that's described um, in the immediate. So how does it work? So first of all, your ALU needs to be able to compare. And how do we compare? Subtraction. Right? So by subtracting it, the two numbers, then you know whether you have negative number, positive number, or equal to zero. So if I have BEQ, then, which means that if I do the subtraction, the difference will be zero. If it's zero, that's equal, right? So we will use subtraction. Okay, so now we will use, this is an exception of I format using both buses, right? Because usually I format, you use bus A and the immediate. But because this is a branch statement, we use both buses, okay? Bus A, RS, bus B, RT, and you perform the subtraction. So ALU control will be subtraction. And if the result is equal, which means that it's true. Now you need to control the branch destination, where to branch to. 
how do we know so where do we do okay where do we go depends on the okay pc right the program counter the program counter tells me where to go to well it tells not me but the cpu so how does it do remember um the immediate tells you the counting right starting from your next line and then if it's positive you continue to add this number and so for example if this is plus three then i was starting from my next line and add three more lines and that's the destination where we branch to if it's a negative number same thing we start from next line and i also mentioned that why it is next line because in the instruction fetch you add four to your instruction already right? the pc that's why you always start counting from the next line and since this is negative three right so i will start from my next line and count backward three lines and that's your target so this is how we do it so how do we do it well we have your pc right so this is the address instruction address um unit okay, so in the past we don't have this portion yet we only have the add four right? because after one pc getting the instruction i will add four to it right you see that okay and that's your next pc okay so again this is my current pc so this register stores my pc my current address that's how i can get my instruction right and now i feed this address into an adder okay and the adder will add this address with four and i have an output so what does that mean the output will be your next instruction okay and look at this output carefully i feed this output into another adder okay and then the other operand is just your immediate with the 32 bit extension so what does it tell you and this is the branch destination if this is true okay so if it is true you have pc plus four plus your immediate and that's exactly how we calculate the destination right so if this immediate is a positive number then you just continue to add to it right from your next line but if it's a negative number you just count it back okay so now you have two options from the max one is just pc plus four which is your next line one is pc plus four plus the immediate which is your branch destination so what does this max do how does this max determine whether to go this line or the next line or the target well based on whether your branch statement is true or false okay so mpc select so this is the control to control this channel or this channel if i say this channel then i'm allowing pc plus four to go through which means that i'm going to fetch next instruction only if i choose this channel at the bottom to go through now this means that this mux decide to branch to this final destination which means that your branch statement is true okay so this is how you determine whether it's a branch. okay so if this is equal and also this is a branch instruction this channel will be turned on and then this will provide my next pc okay so your next pc is either plus four or the target okay so which means that your plus four plus the immediate okay? that will determine where to go for your next instruction okay so now this is your final single cycle cpu data path and so what you have is what instruction fetch so this will tell you the instruction fetch okay so you have your current pc go to the instruction memory okay provide by the address right and you get the instruction so depends on the instruction type right you do the decoding you have rs rt rd ship among function code or you have rs rt immediate or you have r you have the opcode as well as the target address so it all depends on the type of format okay so this is instruction fetch unit okay? so you have your pc control as well as your memory for the instruction and then you do the decoding the decoding will go to the right register to get the data ready so either r format with bus a bus b i format usually is bus a and immediate with the extended version of immediate and go through this mux so you use alu source to choose the mux okay? and then you perform the third stage 
aerial stage. Aerial stage will perform the, the operation, depends on the control. It's either the, op, the arithmetic or logical function, or if it's a branch, you would do the subtraction of bus A and bus B to determine whether it's equal to zero. And then you have the output of your ALU either with the zero for the branch or the regular the arithmetic, right? And now it is, the next question is, is, do you need to go through the memory? This is the fourth stage. If this is a low word, store word, yes, you need to do something with the memory. Then the output of your ALU is your address. Okay, and then you will either store something into the memory by going from bus B to the data in, or you read something from the memory, then you have something to get out, from, take out from the memory. Okay, and then now the memory to mux decide which channel to turn on to allow the data to go through. If this is a memory load, then I will turn on channel one. If this is just regular arithmetic operation, either I format or R format, I'll allow channel zero to go through. So either way, it will go back to my register file and write back to a register, depend on the format. R format, I will turn on register one, or destination one, channel one. If it's I format, I will turn on on channel zero. That's it. So now you have five stages and then you, your next PC will be ready. Okay, either that be, depends on whether it's a branch or not, right? If it's not a branch, it's always PC plus four okay, because it's not a branch. If it's a branch and the branch statement is true, now you have PC plus four, right? PC plus four and then plus the immediate. Okay, so this side, this channel will be turned on only when it's a branch instruction and the result is true. You have to take the branch. Otherwise, we always just take the next instruction, right? Even if this is a branch, but if you don't take a branch. Okay, so this is the single cycle data path. Okay, so I'll take a break here and I'll continue with the second part of the lecture in the second video.